All right. Well, thank you everyone for being here. I'm really excited to be host that the College of Social Work is hosting the next Grand Challenges event, Survival of the Wealthiest, How COVID-19 Exposed the Effects of Economic Inequality on the Health of Populations of Color. So I'm Eric Garland. I'm the Associate Dean for Research at the College of Social Work, and it's my pleasure to welcome you today to, to today's event. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with the idea of the grand challenges for social work, a call to action for our researchers and practitioners to harness social work's science and knowledge base, to collaborate with individuals, community-based organizations, and professionals from all fields and disciplines, and to work together to tackle some of the toughest social problems that we face today. As those of you who are joining us understand, economic inequality, Structural inequalities and health disparities are pressing social challenges that face our nation. It's fitting that we take a look at these issues as part of the grand challenges. In fact, we're called to do so by the profession. I'd like to thank the College of Social Work alumnus who sponsored this event, Charles Cole, the LCSW from Boise, Idaho. We're grateful for his sponsorship and the opportunity that it provides us to explore this important topic. I also wanna thank the Justice, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Committee for coordinating this event. And we're really pleased to have such respected experts from our community lead this conversation. <clears throat> so I'm honored to introduce our guests and our moderator. And before we begin today's presentation, I wanna recognize the contributions of our American Indian community members by sharing this following statement. We acknowledge that this land, which is named for the Ute tribe, is the traditional and ancestral homeland of the Shoshone, Paiute, Goshute, and Ute, Ute tribes. The University of Utah recognizes and respects the enduring relationship that exists between many indigenous peoples and their traditional homelands. We respect the sovereign relationship between tribes, states, and the federal government. And we affirm the University of Utah's commitment to a partnership with native nations and urban Indian communities through research, education, community outreach activities <clears throat> and community outreach activities. So now our 90 minute event will proceed as follows. We will hear from our esteemed speaker, Dr. Rebecca Utz, <clears throat> and then our moderator, Gavin Citrola Sanchez will introduce our panelists who will share some of their thoughts on the issue at hand and take your questions. So let's get started. Let me introduce our, our panel. Dr. Rebecca Utz is an Associate Professor of Sociology, the Director of the Health Society and Policy Program, and Co-Director of the Consortium for the Families and Health Research at the University of Utah. Her research focuses on how families manage and cope with aging, while her teaching is broadly focused on research methods, epidemiology, and population health. Dr. Utz is a member of the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Committee in the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences and has used community-engaged research practices in her research with older adults funded by the National Institute on Aging. So welcome, Dr. Utz. Please take it away. Thank you, and thank you for having me. Let me get my screen for us. Okay, can somebody give me a thumbs up that you see the PowerPoint as it should be before I start? Dr. S, it's not quite the full screen version. It's not the full we screen version. We can see version. your notes. You're seeing the black version. Right. Um, okay, one moment. <laughs> Stop sharing. How about now? There we go. Thanks you, so you much. You see the full version now? Okay. Yep, that's perfect. Okay. So thank you again for inviting me to think about this topic because while I think we've all lived it, it was a really nice opportunity for me to develop a talk today for all of you where we can talk about sort of how COVID-19 has exposed immense health disparities that already existed, but it laid them to bear and brought them to our attention even more. And it also called to attention our need to focus on health equity. 
So in terms of my talk today, I am going to focus on three different sections. The first one I want to talk about and define for us health disparities and just give us a bit of a theoretical framework for how we think about and identify social disparities and how we um, look at sort of what has caused those uh, health disparities. Then we're going to flip and actually look at some of the data. There's so much data out there, but I'm going to show you some of the highlights about how COVID-19 has affected our population at the national as well as the state level, um, and then how different population subgroups have been affected by COVID-19 in very different ways. And then finally, I will turn our attention to a little bit more forward thinking and action and solution. And what is our commitment towards health equity, particularly in the context of COVID-19? So that is just an overview of where this talk is going to go today. And with that, I will jump into sort of setting the framework of just looking at health disparities. And health disparity, if you look up the word disparity in a dictionary, you're gonna see it defined as a difference, as an inequality. Um, and the actual term health disparity was started to be used in the United States around 1990. And it refers specifically to a type of health difference that is closely linked to an economic, social, or environmental disadvantage. And we're not, are, we're not just looking at individual differences in health. We're looking at how different subgroups within the population have been systematically discriminated or excluded so that they, and that is the result of, or that results in differential health experiences for subgroups of individuals. And these subgroups may be defined by race, ethnicity, religion, uh, income, socioeconomic status, mental health, disability, sexual orientation, geographic location, et cetera. So with that framework in mind, as we want to look at what are the health disparities associated with the COVID-19 pandemic, we also, what I want to set the framework is, is it requires us to look at a framework of the social determinants of health. And when we talk about social determinants of health, it is now saying that so much of our health and health outcomes, our access to health care, are associated with our broad social and environmental influences in our lives. And because different subgroups of populations are exposed to these at different rates, this is really the causal agents that are associated with the health disparities that we see in particular outcomes. So most of you as social workers, which I assume is the audience here, have, have probably been exposed to the social determinants of health framework. And the five major categories of the social determinants uh, boil down to education access and education quality, the access and quality of health care that we each receive. Um, our health is also influenced by our neighborhood or built environment and all of those environmental influences at a fairly sort of micro level as well as environment at a, at a macro level as well. All of our social and community context, what sort of resources do we have in our, in our society, in our community, in our culture? Uh, and then finally, economic stability, which was one of the main goals of today's talk was to talk about sort of this grand challenge of economic inequality. And what are the resources that people have, then how does that influence their health? Now, when we look at this social determinants of health, it becomes really important as we think about the causality of health disparities. But it's also important that these social factors, or it's important to remember that these social factors co-occur or are correlated with all of the individual demographic characteristics, like race and ethnicity, age, gender, and sexuality. And so sometimes as we talk about health disparities, it is difficult to tease apart whether it is what the causality is. It's not caused by race, but race may be associated with access to health care or education or income opportunities. Um, and all of these different factors are sort of a tangled web. Um, and so I want to just lay this framework for us to start to think about what are some of the causes underlying the health disparities in the COVID pandemic that we will see over the next few slides? And to draw out this theoretical framework a little bit more around 
the notions of income inequality, I want us to think about a life course perspective for a moment. And I want us to think about how does income affect health at the various stages of the life course from birth to old age. And we know that income at every stage of the life course is going to be affected with an individual health outcome. But if we're talking about at birth and childhood, we are more interested in what is the economic resources of the family of the child. If we're talking about an old age, it then becomes a notion of what sort of income and resources does somebody at the older ages have in terms of retirement savings. So even the notion of income, if we break it down into a life course perspective, it is a different aspect of income. So birth and childhood, it's the parental socioeconomic status. At adolescence and young adults, the economic uh, indicator there that's influencing health is much more associated with educational attainment and educational opportunities. Whereas in the work and career stage of the life course, it's occupational, um, the occupational environment, occupational prestige, as well as the income associated uh, and the stability of a career or job. Now, all of these different aspects of income are associated empirically and theoretically with health outcomes at every single stage. As we adopt the social disparities and a social context of health framework, we also have to know that across the life course that something that happened earlier is going to affect our future. So our earlier economic opportunities are going to affect our later economic opportunities. Same with health. Whatever our health status was before and health behaviors that we created before, we carry with us throughout life. Now, the thing that gets a little bit tricky when we start to talk about health disparities is that this web is a little bit more tangled because we can start to see these cross leg effects. Whereas the dynamics that are happening in childhood that are linking health and economic, um, economic opportunities can further increase fewer opportunities or maybe make available greater opportunities in terms of education or occupation later in the life. So I just wanted to run through this example to show you that this connection between income and income inequality uh, with health is so, it, well, you can take my word for it, in the literature that is such a well-established relationship. And theoretically, as we begin to think about the causality of this, it becomes a pretty tangled web. And so as I show us the health disparities that have existed um, and persisted and emerged during the COVID-19 pandemic, I want us to think about sort of the causality. And so I might show you some racial and ethnic differences, but then can we put them in that framework of the social disparities of health and think about what is it about being a particular race or being uh, of a particular educational status that has led to a series of stressors for individuals. So as I turn to the COVID-19 pandemic, this is the part of the talk where I'm going to show you a lot of data. There is so much data out there from the past year. And I have tried to pick out some high points to tell a story about how the COVID-19 pandemic has affected the health of our entire population, as well as specific subgroups within our population. So as of last night at 730, I think is when I pulled these data off of the WHO website, there have been in the past year, 120 million confirmed cases of COVID globally. And that amounts to almost 2.7 million COVID related deaths. And perhaps the world context is a little too big for you to wrap your head around. So if we just look at the United States of America, we have had 29 million confirmed cases of COVID to date, which has been almost exactly a year. Um, and these trends show you the daily number of confirmed cases um, in the United States. And in the United States, we have now had over a half a million COVID related deaths. Um, the trends in the US are similar to the trends in the world overall. And still, if the US context is a lot for you to get around, I know that a lot of you are in the Utah context. And so in terms of the state of Utah, to date, 
uh, we have had 379,000 confirmed cases of COVID with 2,000 deaths. And I want us to take a moment that even though in these statistics that I will report to you today, I'm aggregating them, I'm talking to you about trends, I think it is so important for us to pause for a moment that every point on these lines at Utah, in the world, and um, in the United States is a loss of an individual life, and this is a loss for families in our community. And so I think it's important to just recognize that uh, and not skip over the tremendous amount of loss that and grief that our societies and world um, are coping with in terms of the COVID-19 pandemic. So in terms of Utah, the rate of deaths, um, it's only about less than one half of a percent of people that are confirmed COVID have died in the state of Utah. In the United States overall, it's a little bit closer. It's about 1.7 to 1.8 percent of confirmed COVID cases um, have died from COVID. And in terms of the actual numbers in Utah or the United States, it is estimated at this point about 11 percent of the total population has been confirmed COVID positive over the past year. So. That's the general picture of what we've seen. We see these statistics every day on the news. And I want to now walk us through how different subgroups of the population have experienced COVID. So last April, this was one of the first maps that came out as immediately we started talking about COVID and we started seeing data being tracked. And so this is a figure that came out in April in the Salt Lake Tribune that shows by zip code differential rates of COVID-19. And already in April, in the first months of the pandemic, uh, we see that there are perhaps emerging hotspots in particular uh, zip codes, and then there are some zip codes that had zero cases. We know that this has shifted around over time, um, but this was the first start of tracking that we started to see that not everybody is going to be affected by this pandemic in the same way. Um, here is another map of the full state of Utah, where if you can sort of place uh, what you know in terms of Utah, but you will see by the colors that there are some counties and health districts where there have been less than one in 25 of the population that has had a confirmed case of COVID. In the darkest counties, such as Provo here in the middle of the graph, um, the rate of COVID infection is about one in eight of the adult population um, that we have seen. So this too is starting to show us that there are definite differences in who is getting COVID um, and who has been confirmed in COVID. And I think that what we began to see with these data is this notion that any sort of crisis, whether it's a natural disaster or a pandemic like this, it exposes the fault lines in our society. And what I mean by that is it begins to show us the cracks. It begins to show us that we can look into those cracks and those differences to understand the health disparities and to understand or to start to think about what are the social determinants of health. So over the next few slides, I sort of want to dig into this crack uh, where we are beginning to see that COVID-19 pandemic has certainly exposed, um, but has even exacerbated many of the health disparities that we have seen in our population by income, by race and ethnicity. And so this first figure, I think, is an incredible summary of truly the differences that have been experienced by race and ethnic groups in the United States. These data come from the CDC. And what you can see, there's a line showing um, the number of confirmed cases. The middle line is hospitalization rates and the bottom line are deaths associated with COVID. And each of these numbers are representing um, a rate ratio compared to the white population. So for example, in the confirmed cases, American Indians, Alaska Natives, and uh, non-Hispanic uh, individuals are 1.7 times more likely or as likely to be a confirmed case of COVID than the white population. And if you look at the next rows, we see that the hospitalization rate, so these are of confirmed COVID cases, 
the hospitalization rates for the American Indians is 3.7 times greater than that of the white population with a confirmed COVID case. Um, you see similar disparities with the Black and African American population being two times, uh, 2.9 times um, as likely to be hospitalized with a confirmed case of COVID compared to the white population. Um, the death, dis the disparities in the mortality rate associated with confirmed COVID cases also shows that American Indians, Black and African Americans, and then our Hispanic and Latino populations are at such a significantly increased risk of more severe illness and mortality associated with the COVID-19 pandemic. This figure to me really is the most sobering figure of the COVID-19 pandemic that shows the disparities, that this pandemic has not affected all of us and all population groups in the same way. So now if we go back to that social determinants of health framework that I talked about a moment ago, we want to think about, well, what's underlying this? Why are some of these subgroups by race and ethnicity at a higher vulnerability? Why are they at a greater risk? And here's just a few pieces of data that I found that I wanted to present to you that show the racial and ethnic differences in who is unable to work from home. So in this top part of the figure, you can see that almost two thirds of the Hispanic and Latino population of adults lived in a household where there was at least one adult in the household that was unable to work from home. So about two thirds of these households had somebody that was an essential worker that needed to be out in the community and therefore is at a greater risk of exposure. This is compared to a little less than half of the non-Hispanic white population um, that was unable to work from home. Uh, another interesting statistic that I found related to occupation is that the non-Hispanic Black adult population were 60% more likely than the non-Hispanic white adult population to live in a household with a healthcare worker. Now, these aren't just your doctors and your nurses, but these are all of the healthcare workers from um, maintenance and service and janitorial staff to the paraprofessional nurse aides and social workers, uh, where a, there's a high proportion of individuals working in the healthcare setting uh, that are Black. And these, these figures show, well, maybe it's something about the type of work and the inability or the lack of access to um, a work from home type of job. And is this something that shows us those higher risk and vulnerability by race and ethnicity that we saw on the last slide? Uh, another industry that we heard a lot about last spring was the meatpacking industry, where we saw um, a, some COVID hotspots, including one here in northern Utah. And what was found in that industry is that of the people in the meatpacking and meat processing industries, 87% of those that were COVID infected in those outbreaks were non-white. And so that's another example of just environmental exposure that is going to increase the risk of a pandemic due to the types of jobs uh, that different race and ethnic groups or different socioeconomic status groups um, are, are privy to or that have access to. Next, I would like to show you a set of data that talk about sort of the COVID-19 precarity. And this really helps us get at some of the explanations of sort of why are we seeing such differences by race and ethnicity. So in this figure, you can look at just the top if you're interested in racial disparities or the bottom half about educational disparities, but it's comparing the difference, and I'm gonna explain the top of blacks, Latinos, others, and whites. And it's not who has had COVID, but it's of these subgroups of the population that have reported in the past year to experience housing insecurity, food insecurity, financial insecurity, have been fired or unemployed. And you can see that the black population, and in some cases, the Latino population, are significantly more likely to experience those types of precarious situations compared to the white population with the same trends with those that have lower educational attainment, have much greater risk of these precarious situations 
uh, than those that are college educated. So here's another example of how income and race and occupational prestige are all wound together to, to create some of these disparities that we're seeing in the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, in terms of this figure here, this is comparing across race groups, what percentage of each of these populations have expressed feeling extreme stress, anxiety, or sadness um, since the COVID-19 pandemic began. We see income differentials in this as well. And then also that women uh, have reported greater stress and sort of mental and emotional um, uh, challenges in coping uh, compared to men. So what I want to say is that so much of this past year has been stressful. Um, on individuals. Some people may say they have found greater gratitude and um, interest, but the stress is real. And the stress is not just associated with exposure to uh, the illness or exposure to the death of somebody or the hospitalization of somebody within the families. Th that's part of it. But I think that what some of these snippets of data that I share with you are also to say that the stress has caused changes in social relationships have caused changes in our occupational and income opportunities. And what I'm hoping to see and what I'll sort of wrap up our presentation with is that in this year of stress, it's beginning to turn into a bit more of optimism and hope as the vaccines are rolling out. So the last pieces of data that I want to share with you is where are we in terms of vaccination rollout? So here's a set of data updated yesterday. And we have about not quite a quarter of the US population, but getting close to a quarter of the US population has received at least one dose. Look at this map. You can see there are slight variations um, in that. But um, every state is that at least 20% of the population has received one dose. Um, and about right now, 11 to 13% are fully vaccinated in our populations. These numbers are changing dramatically every day over the past few weeks as we've really ramped up as a society um, or as a nation, the distribution and the mass distribution of vaccines across our states. So the caveat to that is the distribution of vaccinations also are seeing a lot of disparity. So on this figure, every state is represented. The yellow dot shows what percentage of that state's population is black. And then the green dot will show you what percentage of the vaccinated population in each state has been black. And you will see that we are falling short in equitably distributing the vaccine to the black population according to these data. Um, so in sum, it, the COVID-19 pandemic has not affected everybody equally. And it is oftentimes believed in a social disparities of health framework that these sort of short-term hardships, so this past year of dealing with the pandemic, can lead to much more durable inequality. And that has shifted all of us into thinking about health equity. And health equity is sort of our commitment to reduce and ultimately eliminate disparities in health. It requires us to think about that health is a right for everybody, but that in order to achieve the full access to that right, um, that we need to target those that are at the greatest risk and those that have the greatest vulnerability. So in summary, I just want to share with you some very positive things that we're seeing in terms of the COVID-19 pandemic, that for those of you who are social workers, we have seen incredible amount of resources and training um, from national organizations with toolboxes and training resources about how do we help people in special populations during the COVID uh, coronavirus pandemic. We also have seen executive orders coming out of the White House that are talking about how do we ensure an equitable pandemic response. Um, it's recognizing these massive health disparities that we're seeing uh, in terms of the COVID context. And 
I was really happy to see that in the Utah government, the vaccination distribution roadmap is called Striving Towards Equity. And it talks about how can we get the vaccination um, out to our entire population with very specific targeted uh, strategies to hopefully reduce um, the risk for the most vulnerable groups by income, by race, ethnicity uh, that we have seen in some of the other data. And then last but not least, last March, as well as just a week or so ago, uh, the federal government has passed massive economic stimulus bills, um, both of them about $2 trillion that provides economic support for individuals and businesses. And then within that more structural um, health equity measures about housing, food, um, transportation, uh, support for businesses and other, other um, community-based services so that we can begin to reduce the health inequities uh, that have come about because of the COVID-19 pandemic. So with that, I think now we're going to turn over to our panelists that are gonna talk much more about the lived experiences in some of our local communities uh, so that we can continue this conversation about how the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed us to very real health disparities, um, but has also elevated the need and our interest in achieving health equity. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Atz, uh, for your very insightful uh, remarks and for providing us with a framework to think about as we move forward and uh, um, I, uh, move forward with our panelists. So let me, I'm very pleased now to uh, welcome and I'm going to introduce our panelists. Um, Dr. Lonita Holo is the co-founder of Child and Family Empowerment Services, where she has served as a clinical director for 17 years. Dr. Taholo earned her doctorate degree here at the College of Social Work, um, and um, she successfully completed her dissertation on the Caimana group intervention, making her the first Pacific Islander to tackle mental health among Pacific Islanders for a dissertation study, and also the second Pacific Islander to graduate from our PhD program. Her passion is addressing the intersectionality between trauma and culture and the shame that emerges from this interaction among families of diversity. Uh, next is uh, Revina Tucker. Um, Revina is a physician assistant with the Utah Navajo Health Services, where she has worked in primary care outpatient clinics for over 12 years. Ms. Tucker is a member of the Navajo tribe and grew up on the reservation in New Mexico prior to moving to Utah for her education. She received her bachelor's degree from Brigham Young University and graduated from the Physician Assistant Program here at the University of Utah in 2008. Following her graduation, Ms. Tucker joined Navajo Health Services and now works full-time at the Navajo Mountain Clinic and part-time in the emergency department at the Gallup Indian Medical Center in New Mexico. And next is uh, Myra Martinez, licensed clinical social worker. Uh, Myra is the director of behavioral health with community health centers. Ms. Martinez earned her master's degree in social work here at the College of Social Work in 2016. Um, following her graduation, she joined community health centers where she provides mental health services to the community and works primarily with Spanish speakers. She also works at the University of Utah hospital, hospitals as a crisis worker and volunteers with Latinx groups to provide information about mental health. So we're going to begin with Lonnie, um, um, then we're going to hear from Ravina and we'll be following, followed by Myra. And guests, if you uh, would like to please submit your questions via the Q&A feature, uh, we'll take those into consideration until, uh, as we move to the next phase. So Lani, if you want, uh, please get started. Wonderful. Uh, so Gavin had asked uh, several questions 
prior uh, to us coming here. And I would love if uh, perhaps Gavin, if you could lay out some of the questions, then I, it would make sense in terms of how I really uh, address these, because I, I'm finding some intersectionalities with Dr. Utz's um, presentation as well. So that would be great, Gavin, if you wouldn't mind that. Um, yes, I was thinking about um, looking at uh, Dr. Atz uh, talked about in general, but specifically to your community, the community that you work with, uh, that you live in. Um, what are what are some of the uh, reasons? What are some of the specific reasons in the community that actually uh, make it that is there's a disproportionately affected by COVID-19. What's mm -hmm. contributing to this disparity specifically in the community? Sometimes there are historical issues. Uh, this goes from way beyond uh, this pandemic, right? So, so what's contributing to the disparity in the community that you live in and that you work with? Um, what are some of the experiences that the community has had? Um, an illustration of how these disparities play out in each community. Beautiful. Thank you, Gavin. So uh, Dr. Oates had uh, presented the fault line. I would like to share some of the pre-existing fault line <laughs> that had already existed uh, among the Pacific Islanders. I'm going to then briefly share, uh, I was given permission <laughs> to share a picture because my, um, my father is uh, Latui no Kekatoa from Vava Utonga from the Tongan Islands. My mother is Lorna Lay Martinson uh, Katoa and she is from the big island of Hawaii. And her father was Hawaiian Norwegian and her mother is uh, Chinese, full Chinese from mainland China. Su Laiwan Ako. I would also like to speak to um, the disparities and I don't have specifics from my Asian population, but I really thought I should bring that up due to um, the recent murders that had taken place among our Asian um, families and brothers and sisters. And I want to acknowledge the, um, the great sadness that I feel and speak to this. So thank you for this platform and for your wonderful presentation, Dr. Roots. Uh, so in terms of the pre-existing fault line that had already taken place and had emerged in my um, dissertation work called Kaimana, which means uh, divine power from the wave of the sea. So that's the idea is rather than to be drowned from the wave of the sea, it's to see the, the wave as a wave of resources, a wave of skills, a wave of knowledge, a wave of support. And what we found out uh, in that fault line was that um, there were already predisposing factors of a lack of building any type of ongoing relationships with their medical doctors. This was already uh, existing from the late 1800s when our people first came into uh, the area where our First Nations and our uh, Na Native American brothers and sisters had already existed and lived. And when the Hawaiians, Native Hawaiians came in and then there were waves of uh, uh, Samoans and Tongans, uh, Fijians, uh, Tahitians, Maori, uh, all of our, our native brothers and sisters, they started to come in. They came in relying upon their families. Our cultural context is that we, we are highly interdependent. It's not just interdependence. It is you rely on the family for everything. And I think we, there could be that argument for, you know, codependence, but in our... <laughs> In our um, culture, that does not sit well because that means that um, you would actually take away our mode of survival. Our survival is to actually uh, go to each other for uh, to trade 
bring food to each other, to be there. Uh, our life insurance is actually to um, go to the family and usually it's through the oldest uh, child, which I am between my mother and my father. So we handle all um, weddings and funerals. <laughs> And that's how we do exchanges. And if you go to the cemeteries and you notice all of the, the Pacific Islander families gathering around the cemeteries, they will spend the whole entire day with those who have passed away and they make a huge meal out of it. Uh, the cultural barriers to the idea of social distancing with COVID-19 was absolutely antithetical <laughs> to everything in our culture. The idea of um, a mother while she's nurturing her baby and she needs to go and help take care of some of the other children. And we usually have way more than one or two children, okay? Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's natural for her to be able to hand that baby over to another sibling or to a cousin or to another auntie or you know to any of the family. And we don't say extended family, we just say family. <laughs> Uh, if, if you have, if you're very close to someone, you've adopted them into your family, you don't say, uh, oh yeah, that's my friend. You call them family. It's, it's more of on an emotional relationship. So these are huge contributing factors. Um, we have one of the highest, uh, rates of deathbed emergency room visits in the country that also emerged from the Kaimana. Uh, dissertation, uh, meaning that many of the, the especially the uh, Pacific Islander males that I had interviewed uh, for my research had stated that they ha would go to their family, go, go to their clergy, they would go to uh, receive uh, any type of help that they could up until the point where they felt like they couldn't even move out of bed and then it would actually be family members. And I mean, literally carrying them out of the home because they're about on their deathbed. And a lot of this has to do with how they see their, their role as being the strong one. They, they do not want to present as quote unquote weak for their family. And so it took that level of um, um, severity and illness uh, for them to be carried out and then hauled basically to the closest emergency room. So if you if you if you take those these layers and these pieces that are actually happening in the the right now in Rose Park in Glendale, if you saw Dr. Utz's, all of you did the the uh, the zip code, uh, our uh, clinic is actually in 84104 and we we actually work with 84101 and 84116 and 84119. So, and 84104. So those those with the highest uh, numbers right there in the Salt Lake County area, that's, that's who we work with. These are the stories that I'm sharing with you right now that are coming out of these zip codes. And so if you put that together and put that with the layer of COVID-19, uh, the idea of wearing masks among each other in the home, that just, again, was antithetical. Um, so therefore, um, without having built a, a relationship of trust with the medical uh, field or the doctors and the nurses, there was a lack of relay relatability. There is a lack of training among the doctors and first responders in terms of working with Pacific Islanders. Therefore, there's a lack of relevance from the Pacific Islander people. Many of them have told me themselves that they don't see the need. So how can they understand the need if they don't see the relevance for the need? Now, the reason why they're actually going to um, Rose Park on um, 7th North and Redwood Road this Saturday at 10 a.m. for uh, the vaccinations for COVID-19 uh, for the Hawaiian uh, and uh, Pacific Islander populations this Saturday is because many of their relatives have passed away. That is why they're literally scared to death to pass away from this um, kind of ominous COVID-19 piece. Many of them still do not understand. And so we've been holding uh, meetings virtually and explaining how to um, look at some of these and present relevancy 
in, in terms of how this impacts their families and what's going on. Many of them have elderly people in our community among the Pacific Islanders that have been in and out of the hospital. And what's, what's impacting the families is that they can text them, but they can't see them until they actually typically come out of the hospital. And so that has put a huge damper on their relationships. And so they're willing at this point out of desperation to do whatever they need to do. So we actually have worked with several families in the Rose Park and Glendale area to practice using masks within their homes. This was antithetical, but they were willing to do it. And we have, I can report that there are two going on three families, two families for sure that are now COVID-19 free. All members of the family had it. They have all um, been able to uh, now report that they are all COVID-19 free because they have been practicing these uh, measures. Um, Short-term needs, um, we need to really deliver and I'm planning on, on delivering the uh, some of our presentation from the Kaimana study to first responders. We are reaching out to the community to actually train. Um, them on what the how the culture is responding to these health disparities, um, some of the pre existing fault line issues that we are now discussing. Um, they need immediate access to interpreters, uh, preventive items such as mask, gloves, hand sanitizer, and just going out to their spaces, just knowing that they can go to the chapel over in Rose Park is really a friendly, user friendly way for them to be able to. Uh, come to their own neighborhood and receive the vaccine in their arms. Um, I would say let's uh, use the interventions that exist right now. Uh, I'm gonna put a shout out for um, the Pacifica webinar series from the University of Utah, the Bridge Program, the uh, Lyona Gym that exists uh, out here uh, in, in Salt Lake Valley area, we use our we run our Kaimana groups virtually. Uh, these university neighborhood partners, which is the community arm of the University of Utah, uh, we are Child and Family Empowerment Services, and there are other folks that are out there using um, uh, that want to be utilized to help uh, bridge uh, this you know, from disparity over to understanding, over to seeing the need so that they can want to understand the need. And um, uh, as we do that um, in a sensitive, culturally responsive and sensitive manner, uh, people are, I really believe that our people are willing, uh, they don't want to lose their family members. And so um, uh, uh, this is, I, I can't even stress the importance of this. But um, I just wanted to let me see if I can share my screen real briefly and show. I guess I go on to desktop. I'll try it. If it doesn't work, then I will. Okay. For some reason, I'm not sharing it, but I wanted to. Um, share a powerful picture of my mother standing in the middle um, of all of her, um, many of her ancestors that were, she was surrounded by with her um, full Chinese grandmother, Su Lai Wanako, her, her father, uh, Samuel Pele Martinson, and many of my Asian uh, family right there in, in Kau and uh, County in Big Island of Hawaii on the South Point area. Um, I want to make sure that we are supportive and, and realize that what Dr. Utz had said and shared, the COVID-19 did not affect or impact all of us the same way. And now people are actually, their lives are being put in danger and people are being murdered because they see them as the people that were, had originated you know, that's where the COVID-19 had originated from. And so people are looking for other people to blame. And yet these are the very people that need the help the most. And so I just want to put out a shout out for them and know that we are here for each other as we move through this pandemic. And I am so glad that um, the uh, COVID-19, if, if anything else, is laying naked and bare the disparities that already pre-existed and have 
for many decades. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Lonnie Ravina. Yes, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, yes, my name is Ravina Talker. I'm a physician assistant here on the Navajo Reservation. I've been here as soon as I graduated from grad school, I came here because I knew um, my people needed me. And why did they need me? It's because I speak Navajo. Uh, and one of the first things we do in Navajo is we're supposed to introduce our clan. So if anybody's listening, I'll do that. I am Tlashche, born for Tobash and Aje, Ado, Tlogee, Dashche, Doki, Ani, Dashundale. So, um, so I might have relations out there, but thank you everybody. And um, it's an honor for me to be here. Just real quick, I think every, um, definitely this panelist and the, um, the topic here is close to our hearts and we've all had varying experiences and being in an outpatient clinic and then in the emergency department definitely opened my eyes. And it was actually a year ago now this month when the pandemic started on the reservation it started in Chilchimbito, which is about two and a half hours from here. And then soon after that in San Juan County, it started here in Navajo Mountain. And the community members were scared. Um, they were afraid, but Navajo Nation, Tribe, Indian Health Service and Utah Navajo Health, whom I worked for, all came together and we were able to develop a system. But as Lonnie talked about and Dr. Utz talked about, there were definitely pre-existing conditions that made this pandemic spread so much more. I'm glad she shared that graph that showed the infection rate, hospitalization rates uh, among native people and death rates were high among all ethnicities, unfortunately. And I saw that um, working in the ER, working with our community here, losing a lot of our elderly people. And that made it hard. And working in the ER, when we had, in the graph that she showed where it was the, when the pandemic cases were high in Utah, Navajo Nation actually had, there's a few months before. So our, the curve actually went higher, like around, from what I understand was late April and May. What was interesting to me was the media, when this happened, we had CNN, we had all these news outlets coming to the reservation for the first time in a long time. And they were highlighting things like, oh, there's no rainwater, there's no electricity. And it's like, it's been like that for years. Oh, they don't have any good health care. It's been like that for years. But the good thing was they were highlighting it. They were bringing it to the nation. And then people were surprised, but we were like, it's been here and it's been like that. And as Lonnie discussed, this family, the idea of family is what made it hard, but also like other ethnic groups, um, multi-generational multi families that live together was really hard, that really made it spread so much faster. Not only that, geographic challenges. Access to healthcare, I mean, having to drive an hour or two hours to the hospital made it hard. Fear was another big thing. They were afraid to visit their sick families. So they were calling us to go do home visits and I didn't have the staff to spare that. So I got yelled at for that, but I was trying to understand their fear. Um, those were the challenges I encountered. And as months went by, as we've seen cases rise and as they've come down, um, it's been very hopeful to have the vaccine. Our last COVID case was early January and we haven't seen anything since. I've been seeing regular colds which has been really unusual. <laughs> I'm like, it has to be, it's not COVID great. So what could it be? So it's been, that's been kind of weird to get back into in clinic work is going back to regular non-COVID because that's all is on our mind is COVID. This is COVID, this is COVID. Check them for COVID. So that's been interesting for me. What I recall from COVID-19 experiences is that these, can, these chronic, disparities that we've had will not be answered immediately. CARES Act helped and the Navajo Nation debated for months before they decided what to do with the money. And now they've been able to get more electricity to the community. 
but they're still without water. So that's another problem they're trying to address is getting water to people, running water, that is. As far as the health side of things, yeah, they're still afraid to come into the clinic. So we've been doing telephone encounters with everybody. Um, our mental, our behavioral health department here with Utah Navajo Health has done wonders. They've been doing home visits with people. They've been doing telephone encounters and getting them to feel more comfortable and being able to talk with their providers and continuing their care, which has been wonderful for us as well. Um, what are some of the, the things that we need is more like professional help, more nurses, more doctors. We needed more nurses to help with home visits. We need more counselors or social work counselors to help um, families to deal with the loss of their family to COVID or the depression that they feel from having lost their job because of COVID. Those are the, some of the things that I've seen here. Um, one of the things I remember just that really stood out as we were talking about this is I was in the ER in Gallup and I had a couple come in and they brought their, their son who was dealing with alcoholism and they wanted to check him into rehab. And the, the both parents, the, the son had to be tested for COVID before he went to rehab and he tested positive. And we we're like, oh no, his parents just drove him in and he tested positive. So we told the parents and they said, what are we supposed to do? Just watch our son struggle with alcohol and not get him to rehab. We love our son too much to so just watch him. Sorry. So they risked their lives to bring their son to the ER. I saw families, a daughter that lost her parents or her sibling, her brother in one family, and she comes to the ER full of fear. Saw that many times. But I know that the tribe is working their best to try to address all these pre-existing chronic problems. And I think it's opened eyes for our tribal leaders, but also our local leaders and our clinic leaders. I know Utah Navajo Health has worked very hard to reach out to the community. We've had food drives, we've had donation of clothes and PPEs. Um, we've tried our very best to make them not be afraid. And as we've done that, we've been able to reach more people. But thank you again for inviting me to be part of this panel. It's an honor for me, and um, I'll be happy to answer any questions when we're when we're done. Thank you. Thank you, Ravina. Uh, Myra, please. Thanks, Gavin. Um, as Gavin mentioned in my introduction, I work with community health centers, um, and I believe for me that was something that helped me see the fault line a little bit more closely. Um, you know, we talked about the pre-existing things, Ravina mentioned, Lonnie, um, Dr. Oaks, that it has been there, um, but I think COVID-19 showed us that it was wider. For the Hispanic, um, Latino, Latinx community, um, some of the things that I noticed that were impacting, you know, we talked about essential workers, right, and having people from this communities, from this ethnic groups, being a big part of that, and, and so things that I don't know that we necessarily considered or thought about when we look at the numbers, right? We see the 400, almost 400,000 cases being reported in, in the state of Utah, and almost 20 of those were reported in West Valley City alone, which I think says a lot of um, the, the community, right? It's highly populated for Hispanics. Um, and then we look at the jobs. So then we look at people that go or work in constructions. They're the people that work in the kitchens to make sure that the food industry wasn't falling. Um, and those members of the community were the people that were showing up every day, right? They're the housekeepers, there's the ones that were making sure that our grocery stores were stuck up. And then we think of the housing, um, where just like Ravina mentioned, um, they're multi-generational, they're multi-family. And so for Hispanic Latinos, um, you don't leave your, your family member that's sick, right? You don't go to somebody else's home and stay there for two weeks until the other person is okay. Um, and I'm sorry, so somebody said there was, a, there was a bit of an echo, so I'll try to speak a little bit louder. 
um, it makes it very challenging for families to leave their sick one, right? We didn't leave the food at the door and then left. You stayed with your sick family member. And so that also increased the, the risk um, and increased the exposure. And, and people just, as, as a community, that's what we do. We stick with each other, um, kind of similar to Rabina's story, right? We don't, we risk being there knowing that the family member needs you. So just some of the, the stuff or challenges that I feel the Latinx community was impacted and why we came in second, and not only nationwide, but also for the state of Utah in being um, highest in cases reported, hospitalizations, and deaths. And so we see that, and then we take into consideration those factors, and it makes sense throughout this last year. I know for me, working at community health centers, working at the ER, I would often hear providers talk about the lack of education or lack of understanding for this communities, not knowing about um, how to properly say safely distance or wearing the mask or washing their hands or hand sanitizing. And what I saw is that it's not about that. You know, it's about the fact that people needed to show up to work every day. They needed to be providing for their families. And, and so that's really for me, what I saw, what I noticed was impacting the high rates for COVID-19 among the Latinx community. Um, as far as what needs there are, um, I think understanding the ethnic groups, really taking the time to understand that it doesn't impact all of us the same way, that we don't do things the same way. And it's not always lack of education. Sometimes you can't, right? Um, when you need to be providing for your family, you can't take three days off work when you're not gonna be getting paid while you wait for your COVID results. Um, you go to work anyway, and um, you don't stay away from your family because you might potentially have COVID. You stay with your family and you take care of each other. And so I think when we look at what needs there are, short-term and long-term, um, I think it's making the resources more specific to the communities, to the ethnic groups, and really taking the time to understand them. Um, I think that's, that's some of the things that highlighted for me and that I've, I've seen working within the community. And then any questions? Well, uh, uh, thank you so much for, for I think that these, uh, um, uh, these accounts that we have had from three different communities, which are we're not having all the communities that have been affected uh, most, but a, an example of three of the communities that have been highly affected. Um, this uh, highlights the emotionality of this and and the the person in this on, on all of these. Sometimes we get lost in the, um, uh, we look at numbers and, and, and Dr. Oates was very good at putting the suffering in there also where these are people who are suffering uh, losses, family losses, community losses. These are our fellow human beings. This is more than just the topic that we talk about. It's something that we feel deeply. Um, so I, I um, thank all of you um, for, for sharing all of these uh, accounts on the different communities. Um, and I would like to ask you a question. Um, I think that uh, I, I often see, um, we're, we're talking about things that communities need in the short term and long term uh, that are tangible things that would make things better. What do we need structurally? What do we need for, uh, so this doesn't happen and these communities don't have these short term needs and long term needs to, to actually uh, help them with the disparities? How do we get rid of the disparities? What do we need structurally? And, and how can we do that? What are your thoughts about that? Um, I don't know if, uh, if we wanna start, I'm not sure uh, if Dr. Atz has some ideas about it and then we can go around it. Sure, I'll, I'll weigh in. And I mean, and how do we address these disparities in a long-term framework beyond COVID-19? I'm not gonna to touch that one, um, but for the most immediate need, I would love to see, or I would recommend as an epidemiologist, how can we get vaccinations to the populations that are at the greatest risk so that we can begin to protect them. And that's not just sort of working around the work issues and the family issues, but there might be cultural issues, there might be political issues. And how can we, now that we have a tool that can help get this pandemic 
under control and that we can begin to control the spread is we need to be really creative within our communities to achieve health equity in the distribution of vaccinations. And so that to me is the most immediate need. And I know that so many people are working on this from sort of a cultural messaging point of view, all the way down to the logistics of how do we get vaccinations into people's arms. I would like to piggyback on what Dr. Oates uh, just shared because I completely agree. Um, I know that um, as an agency, Child and Family Empowerment Services would be willing to become a one of many, this is what we want, we wanna be a team, it, one of many platforms in the local community to actually uh, engage our cultural communities, to talk about getting the vaccines in their arms, uh, to give them regular alerts as to when this will be provided in their local communities, that we will be able to um, have uh, people who are uh, helpful in terms of social workers, possible nurses and doctors that can come together in some of these community areas to even to address some of the concerns that that folks may have about going out to these local spaces to actually get the vaccine in their arms so that they can have local dialogue. So I would like to offer that piece. So I just want to put that out there. Thank you. I think for uh, the reservation, we've actually had a lot of help from the state of Utah and from IHS got a lot of help from uh, the federal government. So we vaccinated as of yesterday, I think it was, or Tuesday, 176,000 people on the res. So we've been very fortunate um, to be able to get a lot of vaccine. And the only thing that really kind of affected us was the, the refrigeration problem. So um, Utah Navajo Health bought one freezer so we've had to coordinate um, how to do the vaccine drives. And because we're doing so many drives, we've had people come from Salt Lake, Moab, uh, Colorado, um, different places that want the vaccine bad enough that they've driven to our facilities because we're not putting any restrictions on it anymore. After we got our 65 and above folks vaccinated and we opened it up to everybody. Now it's just by appointment only. Um, but we, and then the other thing I thought was interesting for Navajo Nation, we've had to learn how to use technology. Like uh, we're not meeting in, in person anymore. So we've used, used a lot of radio announcements on the reservation. People have learned to use Zoom, Facebook, but that doesn't reach out to the elderly. So this reached out to them is through by radio announcements. And the other barrier that we've had is explaining this in Navajo. Navajo language is very descriptive and you have to, so explaining diabetes is not just diabetes, you describe the whole pathology to explain it to an elderly person. So when you explain COVID-19, it's a whole description of the disease process. So imagine explaining the vaccine is the same way. And so helping them understand that. So I've had to talk to the elderly people and tell them that they've been fearful of the vaccine. And I, told, I tell them, the, the cases of people who died from the vaccine are very rare and millions have received it. And the news will always tell you the bad stuff, I tell them. So don't listen to the news. I said, trust me. And I, I remember I told one grandma, she says, okay, set me up, I'll get the shot. So I was pretty happy. So sometimes you have to explain it in their language and the way they understand and they'll trust you. And that's the one thing I've taken from this is making sure they understand where we're coming from. Um, I think for the Latinx community, unfortunately, we haven't done very well as far as the vaccination, and a lot of it has come from fear. So fear to the side effects, misconception, misinformation that has been portrayed on the media. Um, some of what I'm hearing in helping people make the decision to take the vaccine is to go to places where they, they feel they will or, or they can relate. So, you know, going to places like community health centers, I know... Um, Comunidades Unidas was also doing um, vaccine drives so people can feel comfortable 
getting the vaccine, seeing more members of the community get it, and I think being open about it. So voicing the benefits of it, voicing the trust in it. I don't know that there's a lot of the times trust in providers because of the culture and ethnic differences. And so some of that, I think if we change that where we make sure that people understand that this is for their benefit, um, that this is to help and also to, to help, you know, for us, it was really hard to isolate. And so to understand that this is a step in the right direction, but definitely making it in an accessible way where they feel they're coming to a place that they can relate to, that they can be understood and have their questions answered because it's really just that they have questions. And so when they go to somebody or a doctor or a clinic where they don't speak the language and they can get clarification, they're not going to get the vaccine. Right, they want to feel that they can trust the system, that they can trust the vaccine, and they can trust the information that they're getting. So I, I hear there are a lot of, in many of the communities, there are a lot of issues of trust. And that's one of the things that maybe as providers, as social workers that we can think about, uh, how can we increase trust among different types of communities and cross-culturally? Um, and that's one of the challenges, and I'm not sure if any of you have any ideas on how can we increase trust cross-culturally. I guess it's a tough question. Well, I, I'll just say something real quick. Um, I think one of the things that got people to want the vaccine, I think Lonnie alluded to this, is that people experience death in their own family. And so when, so they were calling like early December, when are you guys gonna get the vaccine? When are you gonna get the vaccine? And as soon as we told them, wait, we're gonna, we'll have it here soon. Those that had, I think, a personal experience with COVID-19 were very anxious to get the vaccine. And those that were, um, that don't want to get it, I've tried to ask them why, and some won't tell me why, unlike the grandma who did, but um, I think uh, the providers play a big role in this, the nursing staff, the support staff with our uh, health care center, um, the behavioral health department has helped a lot in trying to help the, the clients feel, the patients feel safe and supported. So that's kind of how, and making sure we have access to where the vaccine and stuff is all explained in the Navajo language. I think that's helped a lot too. We've, oh, sorry. No, go ahead, please. We've opened up our uh, Kaimana groups actually to all populations now, beginning in the summer. We, we've we been running our Kaimana groups for the last year and a half, and we wanted to pilot it among our Pacific Islanders, and we've had 100% graduation so far. Okay, knock on wood. That doesn't usually happen, but that was good feedback and we've been collecting the data. The issue now is to take it to the broader population and our specific reason for doing that is we want to have cross-cultural conversations. So what we'll do is continue to collect data from that because we're gonna run a pilot group in, in the summer and see how that goes. Lots of prayers um, and just really be open to the cross-cultural uh, pieces because what unites us is that we truly have all, everyone has suffered, okay? It, even if, you know, from isolation all the way to, you know, someone passing away that you really, that you care about. I, you know, all of these pieces, um, we all share these experiences. So having these um, shared experiences and and many of our values are are shared um, which by the way are you know anti-hate so <laughs> that's what Kaimana pushes for um, and to have dialogue so we will push for uh, cross-cultural so if, if you have if you have a follow-up on this uh, conference <laughs> post summer, I'll be happy to bring back some of the information that we've had from that, but that's what we're gonna to do uh, to work on this in, in our local community. Thank you. And I have a question that uh, one of our um, guests have asked, uh, how has uh, legal status affected the Latino Hispanic community in accessing and getting uh, help? So Myra, maybe you can uh, answer this question. I will try to the best that I can, Gavin. It has 
impacted in the sense that, you know, I mentioned trust. So a lot of the times people chose not to go get tested or make use of the resources that were available to the community because of fears of how it would impact legal status in the future um, of the trust that they could access those resources without la later receiving, you know, there's always this fear of immigration will know, um, you know, or they're, they're going to impact us later for a legal status. And so I think that prevented a lot of people from going to get tested, from seeking medical help, from getting resources that were available and they didn't know about, but they didn't make use of them because of that fear. It was a barrier, if we want to call it that. Um, and I think it made the challenges even bigger for the Latinx community. And, and I'll weigh in on that too. Some of the data that I presented, the race ethnicity of the case counts versus the hospitalization and the death rates, I, I think are bearing out exactly what you said. So I have the data that, and I presented the data, which don't always tell the whole story. And to me, when I looked at that, I'm like, oh, well, I think that a lot of the vulnerable or so the highest risk race and ethnic groups, um, they weren't getting tested, but they were, as soon as their symptoms were so severe, um, they have much higher hospitalization rates. And so, but that's where we are missing them, that there wasn't as much of a disparity in the confirmed case rate, uh, but there was significant disparities in the death and the significant illness hospitalization rate. And I think that partially is because we missed a lot of them in the testing. And in terms of the legal status, I think that's also another barrier, pretty significant barrier in vaccinations. Um, because in order to make an appointment, you need to have, you have to show some sort of identification going in. And so I think as communities, we need to think about how do we protect our entire population and our population health, we need to think about getting the vaccine to everybody, whether they have a um, legal identification or not, because that is a protection for our entire community and our population if we get more and more vaccine um, to all of them. And it, I think as we go on in vaccine distribution, um, I think we also need to think about the location of where vaccination drives are. Do we take the vaccine to people or are we requiring people to come in uh, to particular sites? And so I think that there's a lot of creativity that we will see as we continue to protect our entire population through vaccination efforts. Yeah, and as talking about uh, vaccinations, one of our guests is asking, and we may or may not have a, the answer to this, if we know of, uh, uh, resources for communities to get vaccinated in their homes. Are we seeing any of those yet? Yeah, I think there's a collective uh, uh, answer that at least of, that we know of, um, we have not seen any, but we don't, I don't know that any of us have the right answer for that one, but uh, we don't think so. Um, also, um, uh, about weekend drives in Salt Lake City. I think those uh, questions might be better answered through uh, the Department of Health uh, website on where to vaccinate and how vaccines are being uh, dispensed throughout the communities other than through the health department. Now the University of Utah is doing some to their insured patients, um, but maybe, I don't know if any of you have more information about vaccines and where they are being distributed. Just the one this Saturday. Uh, and if you want, I can always forward that one to you, Gavin, so that you could forward that to everyone else uh, uh, or have it posted. But it's going to be this Saturday at 10 a.m. on 7th North. But that they have specifically set that up according to the flyer I received for um, uh, Pacific Islanders 65 and older. And then if they're younger than 65, uh, they 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 have a list of if they have pre-existing conditions where they really need to get into the get the vaccinate the the vaccinations. We're not at the level that Ravina had spoken about. They haven't opened it up to everyone yet among uh, our Pacific Islander populations. But that I was so grateful to hear that they did, they're doing it on a Saturday uh, <laughs> at 10 a.m. this Saturday. So thank you. 
Um, and another question uh, that I, that I wanted I wanted to ask um, is we often talk about uh, resilience, and we talk about we talked about suffering a lot, but we, I also want to think about the other side of this. And um, we often talk about resilience. We we talk about uh, how individuals and communities actually um, reinvent themselves. They continue. They survive. And um, I think I, I think I like to think about this as um, uh, acts of resistance to oppression. And I wonder how communities are resisting to oppression. How are they resisting to the uh, injustices to these health disparities? And if you have any examples of what are communities, and, and these are not, don't need to be huge things. Sometimes there are very small steps that people or individuals, communities take to resist injustice. Um, and I wonder uh, in, in your communities, uh, what are communities, you know, uh, refusing to surrender about their, their culture, about themselves? How are they resisting the injustice of, of disparities, of health disparities? I was going to say, I think our, um, our tribe did a good job demanding that we get the vaccine as soon as possible, um, given that the, the infection rate was so high and we suffered so many deaths and so quickly on our reservation. Um, I think that the tribal leaders did their best to do that. And then Utah Navajo Health worked very well with the governor and the state of the, the, the Department of Health to also work with us on that. So I think, um, you know, uh, fighting for our community that we get the vaccine to, I think that uh, helped a lot. And individually, I think people or families are trying to learn and and ask questions um, for themselves and for their family. I've noticed a lot of that recently. Uh, I just noticed that Jennifer uh, Nozawa had posted that uh, as of March 24th, those that are 16 and older will have access to the vaccines. I'm super excited to hear that. Thank you, Jennifer, because uh, I will definitely put out the word on that from where we're at. Um, I think uh, how our, some of our people are resisting um, in, is, is they, res they are absolutely resisting to surrender who they are. <laughs> they will not, uh, uh, in no way, shape or form, they will die before, and I mean this seriously, before they give up any sense of cultural identity. They will not. Uh, they will hold their funerals. They will do it they will mourn with their dead. Uh, if, if there are less people coming, which has been the case to, to many of our funerals due to the COVID-19, of course, um, but they will not, uh, they see it as succumbing um, to, to uh, this idea of not being present for the burial of, of their dead. That, that is suicide for them. So they're not willing to let go of who they are, Gavin, to answer your question. They, they will not release and, and uh, in any way, shape or conform if it means losing their cultural identity because that is who they are. And um, they're not willing to forgo that. Uh, and because they, they're determined to hold on to that, to pass on to their children and to share with the community. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you. Oh, and they sing their songs, very powerful. Yes. And they won't stop singing <laughs> either. <laughs> I think for the Latinx community, the, the resilience comes in unity, right? Um, you suffer together, but you work through it together. Um, and so also adapting, I've seen, I don't think age matter, right? I, I saw older people following directions, um, adjusting if they didn't have the means or the resources for the, the mass, the surgical mask, they, they would find the way to make their own mask. Um, and so I think they adapted to what needed to be done in order to maintain their unity, to attend funerals, to stay together, to still visit, to still support each other. Um, so yeah, they, we suffer together and we work through it together and we make it up together. Thank you. Uh, these are, these are uh, pretty amazing if you think about it. Uh, cultural identity, unity, adaptation, 
Uh, Ravina talked about organizing and pushing for what is needed and advocating. Uh, these are the resources of our communities that if we take into consideration when we organize all these vaccine drives, education and all of these things, um, I really want to thank all of you uh, and all involved to our, uh, our also our highly respected guests for their time today and for their service on this critical issue. Uh, we also want to thank our generous sponsor, Charles Paul, MSW class of 1981, and to the Justice, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Committee. We want to thank all of you for joining us and those of you who have continued to support our emergency student fund through programs such as this one. The College of Social Work is committed to, to the speaker series as part of our effort to address the grand challenges for social work, which in reality are the grand challenges for our community. We hope that you all join us in April for our next Grand Challenges event. Details will be available in the coming weeks. And please visit the college event page for more information on all of our events at socialwork.utah.edu slash events. So good afternoon to all of you and please stay safe. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, people.